This morning I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and uh, I don't have it up on the screen today. This is a passage of Scripture with several verses, and we're going to read it from our Bibles. You might even have it on your tablet in front of you. But uh, turn, turn to me with Act, to Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, we know that Luke is the writer of the book of Acts, and so he begins it by addressing uh, an individual by the name of Theophilus. And we read it here in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After, his, uh, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift. Everybody say, the gift. Amen. How many of you like to get gifts, right? All right. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I will make notice with you as we are reading this passage. The gift the Father promised and the baptism with the Holy Spirit are one and the same. That is what's being referenced here. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by His authority, but you will receive power. Everybody say power. power. Okay. Receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. After He said this, He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid Him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. How many of you know that day could be today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he'll come back to take us home. Father, I thank you for the word this morning to our hearts. I pray, Father, Lord, that that which the Spirit of the Lord has been stirring in my heart this week to share, Father, would just flow freely. May our hearts be receptive and ready for what the word is to our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody say, I receive. I receive. Okay, let's be ready to receive this morning. After the resurrection... Now, a lot of times people will wait, say, Pastor Dave, shouldn't you be waiting until after Easter to preach this message and maybe closer to the day of Pentecost? You know what? This message is for today for us. I believe it with all my heart. I, I can't wait. I believe the Spirit of the Lord has been stirring in my heart about some messages that we're going to be hearing in the next several weeks. After the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples. He appeared for a period of 40 days. And what did he do? Well, he was preaching about the kingdom of God. That's why their question was, when is this going to happen? They're thinking of some kind of an earthly coming and an earthly reign, which will happen someday, we know in the scriptures. Their mind was kind of in that train of thought. But he was preaching about the kingdom of God, how we live it out. How many of you know you're living out the kingdom of God today? Jesus is your Savior, He's your Lord, and you're living for Him, the kingdom of God. After all, what did Matthew 6.33 say? Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, and all these things shall be added unto you. So that's our life today, and that's our witness. At, at one point, while he was eating a meal with them, isn't that kind of cool? He's in his glorified body, and he's eating a meal with them. Did you notice that? I think that's awesome. He's enjoying a meal with them. He's eating a meal with them, and he gave a command to them. And we find that in verse 4. What was the command Jesus said to them? He said, Do not leave Jerusalem. Do not leave Jerusalem. 
Let me make some observations here, just a couple quick observations about what's, again, happening around this time. This particular meal, in verse 4, he's sitting down and eating with them, is before he meets with a crowd, because he does meet with a crowd of people. He ascends to heaven on the 40th day of all of these appearances that he's been making. It was on the 40th day they were all gathered together, not in Jerusalem, but at the Mount of Olives. Of course, this is where he ascended to heaven. Jesus emphasizes the importance of this command. When Jesus gives a command, you think it has to be pretty important. He's sitting at the meal. He's sharing this command. He tells them, you're going to go to Jerusalem, you're going to stay there, and you're going to wait. Anybody have trouble with waiting? You're in the drive through line, you're at the bank teller line, you're at the grocery store line, you're stuck in traffic. How many really like that? And you're waiting. Wait until you receive the gift. This indicates to them and to us that they needed, if there's going to be some waiting, there's going to have to be some getting priorities straight. What is most important to you? You hear the old phrase, good things come to those who wait. Kids, if they see presents under a tree, you, say, you have to wait. Some people wait for a birthday party or a festivity or something like that. Or a bride-to-be has to wait. There's a lot of waiting that goes on in our lives. We have to wait upon the Lord. Actually, we read it in, in Isaiah. It says, to wait upon the Lord, you'll renew your strength. Do we know what it means to wait on the Lord? I think Jesus was teaching them a lot of it during his earthly ministry. But we're to wait. You go there and wait for the gift. They did not know how long they were going to be waiting. But you're to go and wait. We discover later from the scriptures that it was for 10 days as the gift the promise, the baptism that he's referring to of the Spirit was given out on the day of Pentecost or the feast thereof. In verse 8 of chapter 1 and what we've been reading, Jesus tells the disciples that the gift was going to be received, that was to be received by them, was to have a result. What was the result? Power. Power. You and I need that this morning. And I'm going to share in just a few moments a little bit deeper on what this power looks like in and through our lives. We learn from reading in verse 12 that when Jesus had given His great commission and He ascended to heaven, now we didn't read verse 12, but you can go on and read that there. He gave a, he gave a, a commission and then he ascended. The crowd then did what? Return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Because remember what he told the disciples. I could almost hear the disciples telling the crowd these things. Are you putting yourself there with me? Put yourself in the crowd. Hey, everybody. They told us Jesus is coming back, but guess what Jesus told us back at a meal? He said, we can't go out and do this great commission yet. I know we're excited about sharing, but Jesus told us we got to go back to Jerusalem because he's got a gift to give us. How many of you think if Jesus has got a gift for you, you want it? He's a giver of good gifts. Man. Yes, we got to go back. So come on, everybody, let's go. There's a gift. We got to go back and wait for it. Now, we find that there was a big crowd there, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a few moments because, you know, we see in the, in the Scriptures there's about 120 in the upper room. But Paul even said in 1 Corinthians 15 that there was about 500 gathered there when Jesus ascended. So I'm jumping ahead of my notes right now. You're okay with that, right? Okay? And so here's this crowd of 500. I actually think it was bigger than 500. Here's the reason why. When they did a lot of counting in those days, 
Sorry, ladies, they usually counted the men. Sometimes the ladies weren't included in their counts or the children. So I have a, I have a feeling there was a lot more than that. And so it's like, we got to go back. There's a promise. Jesus gave it to us. How do you know it's true? Because he told us while he was eating with us. And there's a gift for all of us. Do you know that that same promised gift they received is the same gift promised to you today for all of us? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're still the church. The church of that day still lives on today. Can you say amen? Theophilus. I wrote about these things that Jesus began to do and to teach until he was taken up. He began and he is still doing. There is no conclusion in the book of Acts to say, seal it up, the promise is over, you're the only ones that get it, and those that live in 2024, sorry for your luck. No. The same gift. Some of you here today say, Pastor Dave, I've received the gift. I've received the gift. I received the gift. It's for all. He doesn't leave anybody out. Have you ever been to a party and they ran out of parting gifts? I didn't get a gift. You got one, but I didn't. That's not how Jesus is. Because he knows you right now where you are seated. He knows right now what has already been shared with you from the scriptures and from what Jesus has said. And this is for you. Are you ready to receive? Do you desire everything that he has for you? Come on, church. You want everything God has for you? What is this gift all about? Why do you need to receive it? I'm going to share with you three experiences that I think I can take us and walk us through that are involved in receiving of this promised gift. And by the way, as I go through it, we're going to talk about that power part of it, and I want you to catch that really good today, okay? The first experience is what I call the walk. The walk. A couple scriptures you can read on your own. Again, Matthew 3.11 and 1 Corinthians 15.6. I've kind of already touched on that second one already. Let's go back to the event when Jesus gave his last words and when they saw him ascend to heaven in the Great Commission. They were told to go back. This baptism was for them. He told his followers, and remember what John the Baptist said? And maybe some of them recalled this. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, and he was talking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, he said, concerning Jesus, he says, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I think a fire is cleansing. I think, you know, how many know that fire does a lot of cleansing? We know that to be true, right? And the Holy Spirit. And because we think of fire, we think that lots of power comes from fire as we channel it. So they, they're going back and they walk together from Mount of Olives. The distance. What about the distance? You guys, anybody like to go on walks? If you don't, you should. We're always told, go for walks, especially if you sit behind a desk all day. Right? Go for walks. It's been beautiful. My wife and I have gone out and done some walking this past week. Wasn't it nice to go for walks? Although yesterday was a little chilly. Sun was shining. It was cold. But walking is good for you. Yes. But this particular walk was life-changing. Life changing it was about a mile three quarters to a mile distance from Mount Olive to, Mount to Jerusalem now back then they talked about a Sabbath walk you know you can't walk so much so far on a Sabbath day well that's why it was referred to maybe your Bible and your translations calls it a Sabbath walk it was about three quarters to a mile in distance I think most of us could walk that couldn't we and it wouldn't take us too long. Although they didn't have the, like, the smooth sidewalks and the pavement that we have, 
they had the trails and the, and, the, and the dirty roads they had to walk and the trails and these things. But they had to also, when they went back to Jerusalem, they had to walk through a valley. This valley referred to in Jewish history as the Kidron Valley. You can go back and read in your Bible. You go back into the Scriptures. It goes back a long ways about to the east of Jerusalem. There's this valley called the Kidron Valley. And it was known as a cemetery. It was known as a burial ground for things found unclean in the city. A dumping grounds, if you will, and a cemetery. In Joel chapter 3, I don't know if anybody's gotten to the book of Joel lately, but let me tell you something. In the book of Joel chapter 3, there's a lot of future uh, prophetic things found there. And Joel chapter 3 is most likely referring to a valley that's referred to in the future as the valley of decision. We know from geography that this is the very valley that Jesus crossed many times on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Folks, we're on a walk this morning. How many of you have had to walk through that valley? You can't come to Christ unless you walk through it. The valley of decision. I, I don't want to walk through. Pastor Dave, come on now. Uh, there's parallels in the Bible. There's a lot of analogy and parables you can make, right? To things. There's a valley that must be crossed if you're going to receive the gift that Jesus has for you. You have to make a decision. They had to walk through that valley to Jerusalem. And they had to start thinking about what's most important, the priorities the things in their lives. How I many of you know that people, I'll, I'll, get to, I'll give my life to Jesus someday, but I've got to take care of this, and I've got to do that, and da-da-da-da-da. No, you lay it all down. Remember, they went to wait, and they didn't know how long. They had to surrender everything that they thought was so important. Well, don't you know, I've got to go to work tomorrow. So it better happen tonight. How many of you have ever told, gave the Lord parameters that he had to do something in? <laughs> Lord, I need it, and I need it now. So I'm going to give you the next few hours, and then I expect it tonight. Right? And God sometimes says, you just got to wait. I know what I'm doing. It's in the waiting. It's in the waiting that God deals with our hearts. You realize of the 500 or so that were gathered, only 120 stayed the whole time. It's in the waiting and the expectation and the yielding of themselves as they walk through the valley which is symbolic for you and I today that first of all, if you're going to give your life to Christ, you've got to walk through that. You've got to make the walk. Lord, I give it all. You know where you walk to? You walk to the foot of the cross. You don't walk up to a preacher. You walk to the foot of the cross. And you kneel before the cross and say, Jesus, I can't do this without you. I can't wash away my sin and my shame and my guilt and my condemnation and all those things that I just know are weighing me down and I need freedom, I need forgiveness, I need joy, I need peace, I need hope of heaven. And yes, when you make the walk to the foot of the cross and you give it all to Jesus, then a life is changed. But you've got to walk that walk. You've got to go through the Kidron Valley and lay it all down. God, get in there and dig up all the garbage in my life. I'm talking to sometimes, I'm talking to the followers of Christ. Listen, you sometimes still got garbage sitting around in your rooms. Have you ever raised kids and the kids say, my room's clean. Okay, let me come and check. What's that? Oh, sorry, I didn't catch that. Or you look under the bed and say, what's it all doing under there? Come on. How many of you know we as Christians sometimes, followers of Christ, we got garbage and stuff stashed in other rooms or in a closet and we're like, oh, pastor's coming over. Better shove it in the room. Shove, close the door. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> or you're coming over to our house. Okay. Straighten up the entryway. Listen, I know what it means to straighten up the entryway. Right, Julie? <laughs> Company is coming. 
it's the unexpected company <laughs> like sorry <laughs> but we live here <laughs> right don't trip over the shoes um the walk oh god it's taking a close examination of our life when we want to receive the gift that God has promised to us, the gift of salvation and the gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we make a walk. You've got to make the walk. He didn't give it to him on Mount Olives. He, he could have gave it to him on Mount Olives in an instant, but he said, you're going to make a walk. You're going to go back there. You're going to walk through a valley. You're going to lay it all down. And when you come to the giver, you say, Lord, I need your power. I can't live this life without you. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 You have to make the walk. If you're holding on to things in your life, the Lord's like, you need to let that go first. You've got to let go of that. Hebrews tells us to do what? Lay aside the sin and all the other stuff that's a hindrance that keeps you from running the race. You've got to lay it aside. You've got to get your victory. You know what? And God will take you just where you're at, by the way. I've seen people that they're still carrying some stuff in their lives and they're like, Lord, would you, would you do, I want to receive your gift. And he says, I will give you the gift, but I expect you to take care of the garbage too. The garbage has got to go out. We've done that with our kids sometimes. They ask for something, we're like, now we could give conditions, and sometimes we did. But sometimes we'd say, you know what? We're going to do this as a family. We're going to do this event. We're going to go out for ice cream. But when we get home, the garbage is going out. Come on. You see what I'm saying? God still takes you just the way you are. You don't have to be like, oh man, I've got to get all this straightened out before I receive this gift of the Holy Ghost. No. See, God knows your heart. And if you come to him and say, God, I desperately need the power. How many think you need power to live above sin? Have you ever tried to do it on yourself, your own strength? You fall miserably flat. You're like, God, I keep trying again and again. I need victory. I need deliverance. And you keep doing it in your power and your own strength. When he says, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. They received this gift of the Holy Spirit He promised because they made the walk. They seek Him. Now some were probably on the way saying, do you understand what we're doing? Does anybody get an idea what's going on here? I mean, they, remember, they had not received yet. They didn't know what to expect. How many think there's some things in life you don't know? You're just walking a walk of faith. You know what? That's what salvation is. It's an act of faith and to receive a gift and to walk that path and not knowing what to expect, all they know is there's a gift waiting for us. It was a spiritual thing, not a physical, tangible thing you open up like you would a birthday present. It wasn't like that. Some might just like, I am so curious, i got to come along and find this out. Some of it could have been just curiosity. You know that some people come to Christ because they're curious. What's going on in that church? What's going on with you? I'm curious. Come on, find out. Come with me. So curiosity is not necessarily a bad thing. People find Christ that way many times. Or someone's like, I'm so excited about this gift. It has to be amazing because Jesus promised it. Jesus promised it. I hope that's with many of you here today. If you've received the gift, don't lose the amazement. Don't lose that. I'm going to touch on that in a moment as I close this sermon. You're like, how long is that going to be? I don't know. I'm having a good time sharing this with you. Have you ever had a subject that you're just having a good time sharing? I'm sharing a subject that I love to share. I love to share this. Because Jesus is the giver. Jesus is the giver. Okay, so you've made the walk, right? Now you've got to wait. Now you got to wait. Those of you taking notes and you have life groups, I think you got a lot to talk about today. Keep track of this. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, and I have that up there, it's kind of small print, so you might have to use it through your Bible. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them. Say all of them. All of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Who enabled them? The Spirit, not man. The Holy Spirit did it. No question what was going on. It was the work, supernatural work, of the Holy Spirit. Let me share with you some observations. First of all, they were all in one place and in one accord. You know, God loves to work in places of unity. You ever been on a job when everybody's trying to do their own thing? People are pitting against each other and the boss and the workers. And How many just feel uncomfortable and you feel like we're not getting anything done around here because we're just running after everything. We're just going this way and going that way and there's chaos. No one likes that. God does wonderful things in a church that's in one accord. They're the same mind. You know what waiting does? After a couple days, are you guys serious about this? Because it's been two days. Are you, are you, are you in? Or are you out? Are you in? Or are you out? Sounds like I can't do this anymore. I gotta go home. Okay. It wasn't that they were losing salvation over it. It's just it didn't become a priority in their life anymore. They had other things they felt they had to take care of. So they thought. We can't be into their minds. We can't be into their hearts. But all we know is, in that waiting process, it brought them closer together. How many of you have ever gone off to a camp or a retreat or some kind of event, and when it's time to leave, you're like, I know kids coming back from camp, they're like, we had so much fun in the dorm. What? They lived in the dorm for several days. They got to know each other. They, they got to figure each other out. There was communication more on intimate levels. Unity, spending time together, does amazing things. That's why the early church was known for that. They got together in people's homes. They had meals together. They were becoming one in unity. And God does amazing things in that. They were one accord. It says in chapter 1 and verse 14 of, we didn't read verse 14 either, but let me remind you what it says. It says, they all joined together constantly in prayer. So there was praying going on while they were waiting. How do you know that when you're praying, sometimes you're also praising? That happens for me. It's just kind of a natural flow. When I'm praying, I'm also thanking Him. And I'm also praying. They're praising Him. It all comes together. I believe from what I read from the Holy Ghost get being given that there was a lot of vocalizing of their prayers. There was a lot of vocalizing of their praising because God took a hold of their tongue. You know, it's good to let your voice be heard in prayer. God already knows your heart, but pray it out loud. There have been times when I've prayed out loud or I've praised out loud that there is something that just happens in my spirit. You know what it is? Jesus promised it. He said, out of your belly, out of your inmost a river will flow. How many want a river of the Spirit to flow? Hallelujah. You're in service this morning and you're singing and all of a sudden there's this river that's flowing out inside of you. It's because you're opening up your voice. You know why it's so important? If you don't do it, it'll make the rocks cry out. Hello? I think that's why it's important. It helps you connect with your heavenly Father. There's nothing like a child hearing from parents how much they love them or how good they're doing or commending them. And I, I love it that when we can communicate that with our Father and hear Him talk to us as well. But this is our love. Julie had mentioned to me years ago something she heard about worship. It's your love responding to His love. Well, He knows I'm, I love Him. I don't have to tell Him. Tell Him. Tell Him how much you love Him. Speak it to Him. There's something that happens for you personally. And to Him, it's a fragrant aroma and an offering to Him. Are you with me still? Are you holding on? I've been preaching good. I need you to hang on. Okay? Is it good? Is it good, Josh? Okay? What kind of power is this? The next slide. 
Hopefully we got it on there. It might take two slides. I don't know. Elijah, Pastor Elijah did it for me. Okay. <coughs> Four kinds of power. Real quickly. You can talk about this in your life groups tonight. Today. There's praying power. How many could use some help in your praying? Listen, you're not more than the disciples. They said to Jesus, teach us how to pray. So I need help in my praying at times. I'm like, Lord, I don't know how to pray. How do I pray this through? What do I say? This gift, this promise, this Holy Spirit baptism will help you in your praying. He will. He's ready to help you. Whether it's a quickening in your spirit about somebody to pray for or a situation or how to pray it or to even pray is supernaturally in the spirit which is that language that God gives you when you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, that promised gift. There's a language there. Now you can pray in that. Paul said it very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says, pray in the spirit and in understanding. He made a distinction there. There's that part of you that just when you're praying and you're seeking the Lord and you're like, Lord, I don't know how to pray, but I just want the Spirit of God because it's the Spirit of God praying through you. Think about it. It bypasses all your selfishness and all your other stuff you got going on in your head, in your heart, and makes a direct connection to God and Satan can't do anything about it. Your flesh can't do anything about it. It is a direct hotline to the Heavenly Father throne room. He said, it's for your good that I go away. Because the Holy Spirit's going to help you to know how to pray. And He'll pray through you. Pray in the Spirit and pray in understanding. Oh, now hold on. This one is going to hit us all. Living out your faith power. Huh. Well, a lot of times we think of the power, and I'll testify to that in just a moment on a couple quick other points. We think of all of the supernatural stuff going on in our lives and things we can't do without the Holy Spirit power, and it's manifest in the, in the spirit realm. But I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit gift and baptism and power will help you so you can live out your faith every single day. Shame on us if we receive the gift of the power of the Holy Ghost and we can't live the life out daily like we're supposed to. And it's reflective in how you live your life in your job. Come on, if you're a baptized, Holy Ghost-filled believer, you ought to be radiating the love of Jesus, not grumbling, complaining at the factory or in the office or in the store, carrying on like an unbeliever. You've got the power and the baptism of the Holy Ghost to have words that come out of your mouth that's going to draw people to Jesus Christ. They're going to say, I want what you have. How come you can talk like that? How come you live like that? How, oh, your priorities. Wow. You can be like David. I was glad when they said unto me, we're going to the house of the Lord. Every spirit-filled, baptized receiver of the gift ought to be just like David this morning. I'm so glad I get to go to the house of the Lord. I can't wait to open my Bible. Come on, spiritual disciplines all of a sudden become paramount in your life. It's like I can't get enough of Him. Are you like that? I can't get enough of Jesus. I can't get enough of His Word. I just want to be with Him all the time. I want to talk to Him. I want to hear His voice. How many are praying that prayer? Lord, I just want to hear Your voice. That's what happens as we live out our life. It affects your integrity. Come on, are you a person of integrity? Are you a person of honesty? Don't be a person of half-truths. Come on leading people to think one thing and you really mean something else, that's not living the Spirit-baptized life. You say what you mean, you mean what you say. You step up. Dads, step up to the plate as the Father. You do the things that you got to do because you're the Father. God's put you there. Moms, you step up to the plate. You do what you got to do. And you know what? You, you put yourself second or third or whatever. And you, it affects your life and how you live it out. All of these things. It, yes, it helps you with temptations for sure. It helps you as you walk through trials. Yes, it affects the responsibility part of your life. Your personal care. I mean, you know, we are, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Hello, temple of who? The Holy Ghost. That means we take care of this vessel. 
And there's a lot of things, and we, we don't have time to go into a lot of other things that can affect this temple. But we must take great care of it. This happens when you live it out in the power of the Spirit of God. And boy, does it help you with your words and your attitudes. All of these things, your behaviors, all of these things, evidences of the living out faith power. There's the testifying power. Oh yes, because you shall receive power and you will be my what? Witnesses. Witnesses. You have a fire in your bones that cannot be quenched. You've got a word to share. You have a greater desire to share your faith than ever before. Be involved and committed to the cause of evangelism and witnessing personally. And the final power I want to touch on before I move on to the third and final point is the miraculous power. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said these words, Signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. He lists also supernatural gifts. And this isn't the only passage of Scripture that's listed. In 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, we have listed the supernatural gifts of the Spirit of God. They are free to be exercised through every, I'm telling you, every Spirit-filled, baptized, receiver of the gift, follower of Christ. It's available to you because it's of the Spirit. A side note, until you receive that gift or up to that point you receive that gift and even beyond, you've already been given something really powerful and important. That is the Holy Spirit lives in every believer. Did you hear me? The Holy Spirit lives in every believer. You can't come to Christ unless the Spirit of God draws you. Come on, you know the convicting work of the Spirit. So if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God is in you. You just haven't received this special anointed gift that he told the disciples to go and wait for till they receive. This is what I'm talking about this morning. But the fruit of the Spirit is for everyone. My issue is those who've received this special gift, this baptism of the Holy Ghost that he told them to go wait for, and they still can't seem to get the fruit of the Spirit living in their life like they should. Now, we can be a spirit-filled, baptized believer, follower of Christ, receiver of the gift, and still struggle with patience? That's a fruit of the Spirit, Pastor. Yeah. How about love? Oh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you can speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but if you have not love, you're a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. God's not impressed. Oh, I got the gift. Woo! You're not immune to your flesh. You still got to fight against it. You still got to love people. You got to be gracious to people. You got to show patience to people. Long suffering. All of these things, right? That's for every single one of us here. Oh, let's go on to the last point. Are you ready? Then we're going to have altar call. I'm going to ask you to come in just a few moments. There's the wonder of it. The wonder of it. What happened? They gathered. They were worshiping. They were praying. All of a sudden, they're talking. And the next thing that happens, God takes control of their tongue. And they're talking in another language. What? Those of you that have received know exactly what I'm talking about. Where did that come from? But, oh, it's glorious. It's the Holy Ghost. There was an evidence that happened. You know, speech in your tongue is the hardest part of your body to control. James tells us it's set on fire a hell. You've got to take control of our tongue. With your mouth comes blessings and cursings. A lot of hurt things can come out of your tongue and a lot of blessings can come out of your tongue. By the way, go back and listen to Josh's message on abracadabra. <laughs> Power of the tongue. Come on. This is what I'm saying this morning. The wonders of it. What did they know in that moment when that happened? They looked at each other. Whoa, glory, we got the gift. We got the gift. We got the gift. And they just let it flow and they let it flow and they got louder. The windows were swung wide open. There's a crowd down below going, what's going on up there? What's going on? Whoa. We hear them. 
Oh my goodness, are, that's just, those are just the Jews from around the area. Those are just the Jews in Jerusalem, right? But they're gathered for the day of Pentecost from all around the kingdom of the Romans where they had been scattered about and they came in and they're like, I hear them speaking in our language back home. I speak, I, I hear, you know what? They're speaking the wonders of God in our tongue back home. This, what does this mean? Peter gets up. He's now baptized receiver of the gift. He gets up. The windows are swung wide open. There's a crowd gathered. And he begins to say, this was what was promised by the prophet Joel. And he shares it. Then the Holy Spirit conviction falls upon the crowd of thousands. Are you with me? Are you in the room looking out the window? Are you in the room looking out the window? Are you baptizing the Holy Ghost? And you've been praying in an unknown tongue and you look out there and he's preaching like he's never preached before because the Holy Ghost has got a hold of him and he's speaking the words that he's hid in his heart. You see, he had studied the Scriptures. Now it's flowing. You want to be able to flow in the Word? Get baptized in the Holy Ghost because then the Spirit of God works with the Word of God and then it like a two-edged sword flows from your mouth and you're going to say things you never thought you'd say but you know it's of God. You know it's of God. People are like, what do we do to be saved? Repent. Then they got water baptism going on shortly thereafter. Go down to the river. We're going to get you baptized too. But they gave their heart to the Lord. Over 3,000. That again, probably was just the men that they counted. Can you talk about a citywide revival? How did it happen? It happened because they did the walk. This church got to make the walk. Are you with me? We got to be willing to make the walk. I've been telling you, I believe God wants to pour out the Spirit upon us, and I believe in the miraculous. We've got to be willing to make the walk. We've got to be willing to wait. You've got to be willing to wait upon. I just want God to use you. Make the walk, and you need to wait. The wonder will come. But you can't buy step. You can't step over the other two. They're necessary. Let me try to wrap this up. I'm trying. Speaking in that unknown tongue was simply the evidence. They weren't up there seeking that. They didn't know what to expect. Remember? What were they? Lord, just whatever the gift is, we want it. You told us we can't leave here until we receive. We're just praising you and we're thanking you. And Lord, we just need the gift. We want it. We've sacrificed all to be here. It wasn't evidence. And it is the evidence. It still is today. What does it say in the book of Acts? For those of you taking notes, you can highlight these later. In Acts chapter 8, Peter's preaching in Samaria. People are getting saved. People are getting baptized in the Holy Ghost and begin to speak in other tongues. And there's this guy over there, he's referred to in the Bible as Simon the Sorcerer. He's like, ooh, look what's going on. I wish I could have that power. Peter's going around laying hands on people and praying for them, and they're praying in an unknown tongue. How much does that cost? Ooh, Peter got in his face and rebuked him. You better get your life right or you're going to hell. You can't buy this power. No. He saw something happening. He witnessed it. Jump a little bit further into Acts chapter 10. Peter gets this vision. He's on the roof. He gets a vision. There's a house with a man by the name of Cornelius, a Gentile God-fearing person. He's got his family there. And somehow God by the Holy Spirit is making the connection points. And I won't go through the whole story. But I'll tell you what happens in the end. Peter ends up going and he's going to the Gentile. Oh boy. And he's going there. He comes into the room and the room is packed. Are you with me? You're in a packed room. Cornelius is there. Tell us about this Jesus. Tell us about this Jesus. And he begins to tell them about Jesus. Because you know Peter walked with Jesus. Right? Tell us about him. In their heart, they responded. How do you know people can respond before an altar call happens? People can give their heart to Jesus before an altar call is given. And so, in their heart, they respond to Christ. And then Peter decides, I got three points. I'm only on point two. So he gets going on point three, and he's like, What in the world's happening here? They're bursting out, speaking in another tongue. Read it Acts chapter 10. The Holy Ghost interrupts Peter's point three. 
That's okay. We want the Holy Spirit to have His way. And so the Spirit of God is moving. There's the evidence of it. He's like, these folks, he has to go back in Acts chapter 15 to council meeting. Uh oh. I got to go to council meeting and explain myself. Guys, I got to tell you something. The Gentiles are believing and they're receiving the very gift we got in Acts chapter 2. How do I know? Because when, they were, when I was there, they interrupted my point three and they were praying in an unknown tongue. God is no respecter of persons. You know what? The adults were doing it. The teenagers were doing it. And the children. How I many you know God can do it for the children? He's no respecter of age. Oh, Lord, help me here. Acts chapter 19. Peter's traveling down the road. Comes in contact with a group of 12 men who Luke referred to as the Luke refers to them as the Ephesian believers. And Paul asks them bold face right up the front of the way. He goes, Did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? Another translation uses the word after you believed. He laid hands on, prayed for them, and they began to, and they received the promised gift of the Spirit, began to pray in an unknown tongue. What we know this is it was subsequent to a belief. It was a subsequent act past the moment of salvation. And the connection is for you and I today. This same wonder of receiving of this special promise that Jesus gave his disciples before he ascended to heaven is the same and true promise for you and I today. This speaking in tongues is again simply the evidence of a greater work and a gift that is ready to be given to you today. Today. I tell people, seek Jesus. Seek Jesus. Simply ask Him for the gift. 17 years old, I simply said, Jesus, it's as if I'm 17 again. I said, dear Jesus, I just raised my hands. I said, dear Jesus, I love you. Baptize me in the Holy Ghost. And then I started to want to say something else and something flew from my lips that I did not know. And I just felt the Holy Ghost on me. It's as if it's happening right now. My grandparents said, what happened to Dave when I got home? I started living out my faith in a power that they saw evidenced in my life. I was a different man. I was a different young man because something happened to me. Jesus said, go and wait. For some of you, maybe today's the day. And if not today, go home. It might happen before you go to bed tonight. You might decide to go out for a walk on a beautiful day like today and just start praising the Lord and God will, you know, it'll be around two, around the block. And all of a sudden you're like speaking in an unknown tongue because the Holy Ghost got a, tongue, a hold of your tongue and you're, you're baptized in the Spirit. It doesn't mean half the pastor has to lay hands on you. Although there is the thing about laying hands and praying in agreement and others. But I could tell you the moment it happened, I knew, I knew, I knew that I had received the gift that God had promised. And Jesus, I asked you for it, and you gave it. 17 year old, didn't know nothing. Didn't been to Bible college, just raised in church is all, and thank God for raised, that my parents raised me in church. But I just knew something happened to me. They had to get me to the bathroom to get my composure because we had a concert to put on. Dave, you gotta come to the bathroom. We gotta pull it together. I said, but I don't want to. <laughs> so you hear what I'm saying this morning? If you're new to Pentecost, if you're new to the Assemblies of God, listen, we believe in the Holy Ghost baptism. And I have felt for a while I needed to preach this and share this. And trust me, this isn't gonna go in the back pocket for a year or so. We gotta keep talking about this. There's people that aren't here today that need to hear it. You have friends that need to hear it. You in Bible study groups need to talk about it more. I was in a Bible study group and uh, on a Sunday night one time and as a young person, a, a college age, and we were there and someone says, well, I've never received this gift. And they said, well, let's pray for you right now. And right there in the living room on the carpet, they, gave, they started speaking an unknown tongue for the first time in their life. They got baptized in that person's home right there and then. I'm like, whoo, man, this is glorious. Oh, I haven't gotten water baptized yet. Oh, we can make that happen too. You don't have to get water baptized first. 
He just goes by your heart. If your heart is ready, you can be baptized in the Spirit. I want you to bow your heads with me right now. Worship team's coming, and I spoke to the worship team earlier. If you don't want to come, you want to just seek the Lord around the altar, then you're going to seek the Lord around the altar with us, and we're going to sing a couple songs of worship. Listen, I know with our heads bowed and eyes closed, it's at the noon hour. But are you still ready to wait? This is the most important part of the service. We're now going to time of waiting. If you feel you need to slip out, some of you got places you need to go to, that's fine. I all understand that. But we're going to spend some time right around this altar. We'll put that appointment for lunch off, won't we? We're just we're going to spend time around the altar. You can be at your chair. I encourage you to make a walk and come to the altar. We're just going to gather around and praise the Lord and seek the Lord for a while. And if you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm so hungry. I haven't received that gift and I want that gift just like you were when you were 17 years old. I just want to come and tell Jesus, baptize me. I want, to, I want that gift to take a hold of my life. You're not seeking the tongues. You're seeking the Spirit of God. The other will follow. The other will follow. You just worship Him. Come on. Let Him take control of your tongue. Just start to praise Him. Just start to thank Him. I know of a young girl. We went to a service, revival service. She met me after service. She says, it happened to me while I was worshiping. We were in worship service and the Lord took hold of my tongue and I got the gift of the Holy Ghost. Are you willing to make the walk? Let's consecrate ourselves. Maybe today you just need to come to the altar because you need to consecrate yourself to God. You need to surrender yourself to the Lord. Something's going on in your life and you've been battling something and you need to come and just give it to God at the altar. Come and do it with us. Maybe you just need to come and wait. Something's on your heart. Something that you've been believing God for. You have a miracle you need from God. Come while we're drawing close to Him at the altar. Just come and lay it before Him. Are you ready to receive the wonder? This precious filling. This gift that God has given us. I pray that you would come this morning. Father, I pray today. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Lord, we search our hearts out. I know right now, Father, I know it and I sense it in my spirit. There are hungry hearts that want to receive your gift. Hungry hearts. Some here today, we also talk about this as we're praying, about being refilled. Because sometimes we're living off of yesterday. Off of yesterday's oil. Off of yesterday's experience. You say, Pastor Dave, I haven't been praying in the spirit like I'm supposed to then come and let's pray in the Spirit. Let the, let the spigot get turned on again. Some of you, the spigot's been turned off or it's just a trickle and you need to open it wide and you need to just let the Spirit of God speak through you and, and sing through you and pray through you. And this morning, you just want to come to the God and come to the river that shall never run dry. Let the river, the living waters flow from your lips today. Deep from within. Hallelujah.